I wish God to exist. Sadly, my wish means nothing. That's why I focus on arguments against God. My biggest fear is not that there is no God, but that I may fool myself into believing falsely that there is a God when truly there is no God. That's why I must explore with all courage and honesty the strong views of those who conclude that God does not exist. What are the arguments against God? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I start at Oxford University, where I meet former parapsychologist and current skeptic, Susan Blackmore. At one time, Sue was trying to prove the existence of realities beyond the physical. She failed, and now, I suspect, she rejects anything non-physical, including God. Sue, most of the dialogue in theology is theologians putting up arguments for God and uh, philosophers, atheists, criticizing those. Let's turn it around. What are some good arguments against God? The most convincing to me is that we don't need him, her or it argument. Oh, what's he supposed to do? One thing he's supposed to do is create us in his image. Now that we understand through Darwin how the process of copying information with variation and selection can give rise to design out of nowhere, we don't need God to do the design job. Now, that doesn't prove he doesn't exist, but it certainly takes away the major, major re reason for believing Well, I think it. it does in biology, but not necessarily in physics, because you need to start with laws of physics. Those laws of physics seem to be have to have their constants fine-tuned to a very tight degree in order to have a, a physical universe that can last long enough so that evolution can occur. But it, I'd say two things to that. One, it doesn't help to posit a God. I mean, when you take God back that far, you've lost all the things that many people believe in, in a personal God and, and, and you know, intervening in human lives. We're, we're talking about setting up the universe in the first place sort of God. So that's not what most people mean. Um, now, that sort of God, um, yes, maybe. There are some scientists who say, well, what I mean by God is just the rules of the universe. Well, that's not, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's, that, cheating. That, that's kind of cheating. Yeah. Oh, fine. <laughs> um, but if you mean, why is there something rather than nothing sort of God and why these constants? There are lots of, of other possibilities. Um, it's possible that science will find that actually these are the only constants that can be. Mm -hmm. It's possible that it will find there are multiple universes in which yeah. they all right. in some form or another exist. Right. We just happened, obviously, <laughs> we wouldn't be here doing talking if we weren't in, in a universe that had those. The physicist God, if you like, the setting up the universe God, doesn't have any implications for heaven and hell and life after death and punishment and caring about who's good and who's evil. It doesn't really relate <laughs> at all. Well, what are some of those other issues? Uh, what, what, what are some of the traditional things that you grew up with uh, in a religious background that you can now look back upon and say are that you don't have anything to do with. God's so nasty. Uh, that doesn't prove he doesn't exist, of course, but you know, the, the incom inconsistencies and incompatibilities in what people believe just strike me as bizarre. I mean, God is supposed to be wonderful and loving and caring. So is Allah, supposed to be, you know, all merciful. And yet their books, supposedly coming from them, either directly or indirectly, are full of go and kill the infidel, burn people in hell if they don't, you know, do the right thing. So people believe these nasty and incompatible things. Is that an argument against it? Well, it's, it certainly weakens the idea. If people could come up with a consistent idea of God that had a, a definite purpose to fulfill, that would be much more powerful than this mess of a nasty creature that they seem to uh, want to believe in. What about the diversity of religions? Is that an argument against the validity of any of them? 
Yes, I think it is. When you learn about lots of different faiths, it's obvious that they can't all be true. And that if you want to believe in one, you've got to choose it for some reason, like, you know, I, I like the gods they come up with, or I like the, the, the places they worship, or something like that. So I do think the inconsistency is, is an important um, argument against. Some would point to the commonality among these religions that they all have a sense of the mystical or they all have a, a consciousness or a non-physical consciousness and, and, and that each one is looking at the truth in a different way. Right. Right deep down in the core of most religions, I think are some deep and important truths. They are so overlaid with all the memes of, of worship and ridiculous ideas about this and that. But deep down in there are some critical things which actually are rather hard for humans to accept, which is the thing why they build up this superstructure of gods and everything. A classic mystical experience is usually of the form of, in some sense, my normal self has dissolved. I am no more separate from the universe. Everything is all interconnected and I'm, I just am, the, somehow I am the universe and it is me and everything is fine. Now this is a common human experience. I mean, it's not frequent, but you know, it, it runs through history, through different cultures. Deep in the heart, we are capable of seeing that our little selves are not important and letting go and becoming one with the universe. That, has, that doesn't require God, it doesn't require anything else. It doesn't require other dimensions or spirits or souls or life after death or any of that stuff. So I do think there are, there are, there are truths at the heart of a religion, but they're so simple. They're nothing to do with all that religious claptrap. <laughs> Sue argues that the traditional God has no use and is not much good. Dee personal experiences are real, she says, but they have nothing to do with God. For much of this, I go with Sue, but I see her target more human religion than an ultimate God. I want a tough, aggressive atheist who's also a physical scientist. Happily, I need not go far. To the library at Lincoln College, where I meet Peter Atkins, one of the world's leading chemists. I can think of no atheist more incisive than Peter. Peter, what are the affirmative arguments against the existence of God? You know, in a sense, I think I'd quite like there to be a God, <laughs> especially if it was a, a benevolent one, not the one of the Old Testament. That would be rather grim. In order to believe that there is a God, I would need evidence. And I see no evidence. I see evidence of no kind whatsoever. I don't think that sentiment is uh, evidence. Uh, that's this, um, what people call a variety of synonyms of faith, revelation, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, th these are just um, quirks of the brain that have been often impressed upon it by family or, or cultural milieu. So why should I believe in the absence of evidence in the existence of this entity? Scientists who are theists would point to the existence of physical law. Then the constants that are embedded in those laws yeah. that seem to fine-tune the universe. As to the, the constants, I mean, this is a perennial problem. Of why, why does this universe seem to be so perfectly tuned for our existence? I suppose you could turn that on your head, actually. It seems to be much, much better tuned for the existence of rock than it does for people. <laughs> but, but maybe you know, God had a thing about rock and <laughs> wanted a lot of it around. Um, but it's certainly the case that the, the charge of the electron, the fine structure constant, and all that, those, those things seem to be perfectly poised to our advantage. But um, this is an open question. We don't know the answer. There are two broad types of answer that might be forthcoming. One is that the universe could come into existence only with those particular fundamental constants. Um, and it's just luck that they led to 
people like us. And the other possibility, of course, is the many universe. I have to say that rather carefully, where it could be that this universe is only one of an infinite number of others. And they all splatter into existence with different values of the fundamental constants. And we just, and it's not surprising that at least one of them has got the right mix. You don't need an architect to, um, to design the universe if you, did, if, you know, if you have that kind of splatter effect of universes. Uh, science is certainly on the track of the origin of things. And I don't see why it won't come up with um, a model of the inception of the universe from nothing. And that will show that the fundamental constants must have had the right values. Or alternatively, that there's trillions and trillions and trillions of universes. Science is still on the track of discovery. And I certainly can't say and it will be the case that we will not find the finger of God. But there's no evidence yet that we will have to invoke that finger. So either the universe is just right for us by luck, or there are huge numbers of universes, so it's no mystery why the laws of our universe are just right for us. Either way, Peter says, there's no finger of God. Do I feel myself wavering, even in my weak belief? Good. I want to be steeled with arguments for atheism when assaulted again with arguments for theism. I set the test in Notre Dame with one of the world's leading Christian philosophers, Alvin Plantinga. Al enjoys battling atheists. So I'll put to him some atheistic arguments, see how he handles them. See, too, how I come out the other end. Alvin, there are many arguments that atheists use that seem to show that there is no such being that we call God. Let, let me give you some of them, see how you react. Start with the only minds we know are embodied within brains. There's no such thing as a disembodied mind. Well, we don't know that there's no such thing as a disembodied mind. All we know is that the minds we're acquainted with are uh, to be found in brains. That's not a very strong argument, it seems to me. I mean, the only people we are acquainted with, uh, the only rational creatures we're acquainted with are on Earth. Should we think there aren't any anywhere else? I mean, this is uh, not much of an argument. <laughs> How about the hiddenness of God? Well, I mean, the fact is the vast majority of the world's people do believe in God or something like God. So it's not that God is hidden in the sense that nobody knows about him or believes in him. All kinds of people do. Um, God isn't as plain to us as other people, let's say, or as, um, I don't know, trees and houses and material objects. But why think that he would have to be? He might have a good reason for uh, being relatively hidden, hidden to the degree that he is, which, as I'm suggesting, isn't all that great. Let's go on to the problem of evil. While it's true we can't see what God's reasons for permitting evil are, it's hard to see why that's an argument for its being unlikely that God exists or that God has reasons or that there is a being like God who has reasons. because. Um, God's circumstances and God's own intrinsic being is so different from ours, uh, he being omniscient and omnipotent and so on, that from the fact that we can't see why a certain thing happens, why he permits a certain thing to happen, not much follows. It certainly doesn't follow that he doesn't have a reason. It doesn't even follow, in my opinion, that it's likely that he doesn't have a reason. It's just not the case that if God actually did have a reason, you and I would be the first to know. <laughs> we might not know at all. Other views that uh, atheists would take would look at the physical universe. It's violent. It seems pointless. It's wasteful, all these comets and asteroids floating around. And there's a, a lack of, of efficiency. That it, it's just a cauldron of, of chance. Uh -huh. a, a lot here depends on what kind of being you think God is or would be. 
it might be that you think God would have to be like a classical artist, very efficient, um, everything in its place and the like. I mean, efficiency is something for creatures who are limited. But if you're not limited in this way, if you're omnipotent, what's so great about efficiency? Maybe God delights in having things of as many different kinds as possible. I mean, the main point here is that all of these arguments of that sort all presume that the arguer knows what God would like or what, uh, what God would want to be the case, what God would think, what God is aiming at in these, in these conditions. There's no reason to think that we know those things. Other arguments then bring anthropology or psychology into it, uh, wish fulfillment or uh, uh, just uh, uh, the, the development of a group coherence that, that explains the need for God. Right. Now, uh, wish fulfillment, I think that's, um, that's more serious in a way. We find ourselves in this world where nature demands from us suffering and pain and anxiety, and in the end, she demands our death. And if we look this situation full in the face, we would fall into despair and into depression, apathy. We probably wouldn't be able to function at all. So we subconsciously invent this heavenly father who we say is in the heavens and is really, really uh, operating things, really causing things to happen the way they do, and he really does love us. So that's where belief in God comes from. If in fact there is such a person as God, then belief in God uh, will in fact have warrant. That is, it will in fact come from a source with positive epistemic status because he would create us in such a way that we would uh, be able to know about him. He would want us to know about him. He would, according to theism, he has created us in his image. Part of that involves knowing. And the most important thing to know about would be God himself. It could be that God uses wish fulfillment as his means of getting us to know about him. So it could be that, right, Freud's right. This, comes from, this belief comes from wish fulfillment but need not follow from that, that it's not reality directed, so to speak. If you insist that it isn't reality directed, then you've got to have some independent argument against God's existence. If God does exist, our belief in God will undoubtedly, or at least very probably, be reality directed. So if you say it isn't, then you've got to first give us an argument for the proposition that there isn't any such person. It's not an independent argument at all. So at the end of the day, if you sum all of these arguments against the existence of God together, um, do you ever have any doubts? I don't think any of these arguments have, I would say, have, I say they have no force at all. With respect to evil, that's another matter. That can be deeply disturbing to believers in God, such as myself. Um, it can, it can lead one to, um, to be suspicious of God, to wonder why he does all these things and, um, and to distrust him and to be angry with him and to be inclined to shake your fist in God's face, except you know that it's just a totally hopeless and stupid gesture. But it can, it, you, it can, it can, give, you, it can give you real problems. I don't think though, uh, that it, at least as far as I'm concerned, inclines me to wonder whether there is such a person as God. It's more that it, it could make me suspicious, um, distrustful, um, not willing to commit myself to him and the like of that. To Al, all arguments against God have no force at all, except for evil. Still, he concludes with confidence, God does exist. Al is such a good fellow. I'm not sure whether I go with his arguments or I just like him personally. So I've heard arguments against God and a theistic rebuttal. Now I'm ready for the atheistic scientist whom I most respect. That would be Steven Weinberg, Nobel Laureate in Physics. I'm enthralled by his profound sense and insight. I asked Steve about God. The idea of God perhaps might be thought to explain the laws of nature, but it leaves us with the same irreducible mystery. Uh, Anaximander thought that things happen because 
justice required ice to melt when fire was applied. And, you know, th th there was a very human description of nature. As time has passed, we've learned not to think of nature in human terms. And the study of nature does not provide a point to our lives. I said that if we don't find a point in nature, we can at least make a point for ourselves. We can love each other and find beauty in things. And, and one of the things that uh, gives point to some of our lives is the process of discovering nature, discovering the laws of nature. But whatever point there is, is one that we have to give, uh, give our lives. I once said the, our tragedy is not that we're acting out a, a, a tragic drama but laid out in a script, but that there is no script. As in a Shakespearean tragedy, the thing that makes it tolerable often is the intrusion of humor uh, at certain points. Well, I'm certainly not the first person to have pointed out the fact that we have no intrinsic moral guidance from religion or science or anything else. The philosopher uh, Pascal had a famous wager uh, the result of which uh, determined the course of his life to believe in God. Uh, how would thou make his wager? Well, Pascal, it seemed to me, made a, a fundamental error. He, the way he described it was, if you, uh, if you become, not just believe in God, but you are a Christian and accept the doctrines of the Christian church, then uh, according to the Christian church, you will go to heaven. and. Um, on the other hand, if, if the doctrines are wrong, you've lost nothing. On the other hand, if the doctrines are correct and you don't accept Christianity, then you're going to go to hell and you've lost everything. You've lost an infinite amount because hell is eternal torment. So any possible weighing would mean you should adopt the doctrines of the Christian church. Uh, well, I, I think they're the fundamental fallacy, well, there's an obvious one, which is can you really decide what you're going to believe? Uh, I can't govern my heartbeat, or I can't really control what I believe, but suppose you can, maybe people can. I still think there's a fundamental fallacy because Pascal posed it as a choice between just two alternatives. There's either Christianity or, or, or disbelief. But there's a third possibility, let's say. Suppose there is a God who, uh, for example, uh, doesn't like psychophants doesn't like people who believe in him just because they're afraid of punishment, but likes people who honestly try to think about what's true and who rewards those who, after honest thought, reject his existence with eternal bliss and condemns those like Pascal who believe in him because they're afraid in hell to eternal torment. Now, I'm not saying there is such a God, but it seems to me that's at least as plausible as Pascal's Christian God. And if that God exists, then Pascal is wagering on the wrong side. And you're doing pretty well. And I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs>the geography, the time and place and history, all that is fraught with human construction. In my mind, it looks like a huge amount of evidence that we created God, not vice versa. I continue my struggle. None of the negative atheistic arguments against God 
makes much impact on me. But neither do the positive theistic arguments for God. I love both sets of arguments, against God and for God, and I weary of them. After all, if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present, how could I hope to understand such an unimaginable, awesome being? I do not know if I'm getting closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>